The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, theologian and author Dr. Ray Anderson points out the importance of basing our theology on God's revelation of Himself in Jesus Christ. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Mike. Glad we to be here. I appreciate your time. Glad to be with you. And we're looking forward to discussing some very interesting and important topics. Uh, I want to begin by helping our viewers uh, understand a little bit about what theology is and what difference does theology make for, All the, right. for the believer. Well, you've said my favorite word, theology. <laughs> it's a scary word to many people. But really, if you stop and think about it, um, it's simply a way of uh, thinking about God uh, in respect to who God is and how God has revealed himself to us. So that uh, <clears throat> theology, <clears throat> as I've often said, is a uh, reflection upon God's ministry. So ministry precedes theology. I tell the pastors that I often speak to that uh, it's in the context of God's ministry that theology emerges. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, for example, and the legalists uh, challenge him on that, say, you can't do that. Not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. And for Jesus, said, well, that's, that's what God is doing. God is working. And therefore, <clears throat> Jesus said, human beings were not made just to keep the Sabbath in their legalistic way. The Sabbath was made for human beings, for their welfare. Now, that's a theological statement. Somebody could just have said, well, Jesus healed a blind man on the Sabbath, and that's a narrative. But when interpretation is given of that, so that the work of God interprets the Word of God, what God does interprets what God says, and the statement of that, that's theology. See, Jesus had no text in the Old Testament for that. The text came out, the, the blind man that's healed is the text. So when the story tells us something about God. Yes. Theology is what's But the responsibility happening. of theology is to uh, not just read and narrate the story, but it is to let the story tell us and speak to us of who God is. Because without, uh, without the statement that, well, this is who God is, God, God cares for you, God loves you, and God will, will uh, do his work of healing even on the Sabbath day. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Jesus. So that's an example for me. So everybody, uh, is it fair to say everybody has a theology even though they may not realize it or think about it? Yeah, you cannot be a believer in Jesus Christ uh, without, uh, in a sense, uh, implicitly saying, well, I believe he is of God. I believe he was sent of God. I believe that he, as Paul says, he died on the cross for me, was raised again to overcome the power of death. Um, and in reciting uh, the creed, whatever creeds one recites, the Apostles' Creed, that's, that's a, a, th a theological statement. So that uh, the average person in the church, uh, 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 hearing the story and confessing their own faith in Christ, that they are, they are doing theology. So one person might have a view of God based on how they interpret what they read in the Bible that says, uh, God is angry mm -hmm. at me and I need to try to do better to get him back on my side. Another person may have a view, uh, God uh, is way off somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. he's made things and wound up the universe and he's way out there and now we have to just work things out for ourselves. And another person may say, well, God is full of grace and mercy and uh, therefore it doesn't matter what I do, mm -hmm. he'll still um, uh, forgive me in the end and mm -hmm. therefore I can behave however mm -hmm. I want. The next person may say God is, loves me and therefore um, I want to please him and uh, live according to what I understand him to expect of me. Um, everybody, each of those 
four, let's say, and any infinite number of more people may have different views. And these kind of reflect the idea there are many different theologies That's right. on the shelf. That's right. Um, yeah. How See, do you distinguish Well, it, it's, between it's almost like when uh, Jesus asked uh, his disciples, who do you say that I am? Uh, they thought it was a multiple choice type of exam. See? Yeah. So they came up with different possible answers. Well, some say you are John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some say you are the prophet that Moses talked about. Uh, and they had all these kinds of answers. Then each of those were theologies. They were current theologies. And Jesus probed deeper and said, but who do you say that I am? You've experienced me. And when Peter finally dared to blurt out, well, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we've been waiting for. And then Jesus said to him, blessed are you. Uh, flesh and blood does not reveal that to you, but God who is in heaven. In other words, he said, Peter, you're right, but you'll never know why. <laughs> because uh, that's a revelation of God. But Peter wouldn't have been right. Peter wouldn't have been able to have a, that theology. You are the son of God. You are the Messiah. Apart from following him and experiencing him and being there, standing off in the distance, the Pharisees came to different conclusions. They said, this man is not of God, John 9, 16. After he healed the blind man, they said, he's not of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus was killed on exegetical grounds. They had a Bible verse that said, give us permission to kill Jesus because he violated the law. And Jesus must have said, hey, what's going on here? God is doing this work. God is in your midst. God is working through me. So uh, the problem that all pastors face is not that people are waiting to hear theology, not they're waiting to be told to believe something. They all believe something. Every person that sits down to hear a sermon already believes something. And that has to belief has to be taken away and changed. That's the, that's the real task. That's why pastors have to be theologians, because they have to know the, 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 the true theology that God has revealed. And that has to enter in in such a way that it corrects the bad theology. So, so theology is wrapped up in God's revelation of who he is, rather than any other way of deducing or coming. That's right. You. And that yeah. is in the person of Christ. Yes. And in the act of God, I went through three years of theological seminary, went out and started to preach and began to preach my systematic theology notes. God is omnipotent. He can do everything. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's and this omnipresent. Is the, the classical Yeah, the classical doctrine of God. Of God. Yeah. And some of my people hearing that uh, said, well, you know, uh, that may be true. That's easy to believe, that God can do everything. But can he do anything? If he knows everything, you want me to say he knows everything, fine. I already sort of believe that. But what I want to hear is, does he know me in my small place? Does he enter into my life? Does he make a difference in my life? And I realized the theology I'd been taught didn't answer that question. I had to start all over again. I went to the Incarnation. Paul says of Jesus in Colossians 2, in him is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. Everything that God is, is revealed to us through Jesus. See, that's why, again, the Trinity is so important. People stumble at the concept of the Trinity and say, well, it's just a theological um, bit of metaphysics and doctrine doesn't make any difference. Well, it makes a tremendous difference. If the one who heals, and the one who weeps at the tomb of Lazarus, the one who groans with pain and agony when he's confronted with deformity. If that's not the tears of God, if that's not the, the, the pathos of God, then we've lost connection with that. Then we're back to a kind of a dualism, as Thomas Torrance liked to say, my former teacher, that you separate the concept and doctrine of God from the act and being of God and suddenly uh, We've lost touch with that. And that's why legalism and formalism and all of those things began to um, take the place of the grace of God as a living reality. So that's, that's, that's why I think the Trinity is that God is both above and he's below. God is involved. The one who dies upon the cross has to be as fully God 
as the Father in heaven. So the Jesus who says, God, my Father, uh, why have you forsaken me? That, that has to be not only the, the language of Psalm 22, the human lament of forsakenness that Jesus takes on his own lips, but it has to be that God himself has, in a sense, assumed humanity, estranged from God, so that the, the atonement begins in Bethlehem. I, I wasn't taught that in seminary first. I was taught the doctrine of the atonement that it begins totally on the cross. And it was Torrance that helped me to see. That, no, you have to go back to, to the very fact that uh, the one who was born in the womb of Mary was born to assume uh, <coughs> human estrangement, to estrange, uh, to, to assume the senses of death. So that in that sense, Jesus, as the incarnate Son of God, is dead man walking. Can God die? No. But for God to overcome human death, God has to become human, and God has to assume that human death. So that when God the Son, as John says, the Logos, enters in and becomes flesh, becoming flesh has, in a sense, uh, placed God uh, on, from below. <laughs> That's why my, the Gospel According to Judas was my first uh, book on Judas. Uh, I thought, well, there's a way to get at this. If Judas is, is uh, chosen by Jesus after a whole night of prayer, which we assume was to uh, make sure he made the right decision, and yet Judas, one of the twelve, ends up betraying him, and then in his own remorse, says, I have, I have done an, killed an innocent man. I have done something wrong. And in the remorse went out and killed himself. Well, for many people say, well, that's, that's it. Suicide is the unforgivable sin, and uh, therefore that's the end. But you see, what the gospel tells us is that this Jesus, who has chose Judas, betrayed by Judas, he's the final judge. He's the one that will, in the end, determine the final verdict. And most of us grow up in the church hearing sermons, uh, reading whatever yeah. we might read, sure. and we get the idea that God is out in heaven, he's out yeah. there somewhere. He looks at us, he, he judges us. We read uh, the Old Testament and we see God uh, gets angry. Yes. And, and, and so yeah. we think of God as being a, a a judge, an angry yeah. judge, that is so angry that he sends his son to die uh, because somebody's got to pay this price. Yeah. And ends up uh, uh, making the son merely the victim of God's anger. But, but, but you're saying we, we need to see God as he shows himself to be in Christ, as not just the creator, yeah but is the Redeemer That's right. at the same time. Yeah. And, and he's not just the judge, but the judge is the one who gave himself yeah. to save. As Bart says, he's the judge judged in our place. See? see, it's not only that we can set the Old Testament aside and say, well, we don't need that anymore because we have Jesus. It's only through Jesus that we read the Old Testament aright. It's from Torrance helped me to see that uh, uh, with Jesus, we can go back and see the antecedents for everything that Jesus revealed of God is already there. That in that divine covenant that God made through Abraham was universal. Uh, it's through all the families of the earth shall be blessed through that seed that, that's there. So that uh, the particularity of the people of Israel was not simply, well, it's, it's them and not, it's only them, and not nobody else. Uh, that nobody else has a chance, except they want to maybe join in with them. No, the promise to Abraham was the promise to a Gentile. Abraham is a Gentile. There are no Jews yet. <laughs> yeah. And so when Paul sees the Holy Spirit coming upon uncircumcised Gentiles, he goes back to Abraham and says, there is the example of that. And in Romans, Paul says, when was Abraham declared to be righteous? Before he was circumcised or after? Well, the answer is obvious. Abraham, as a Gentile, declared righteous before God by faith, through grace. And then circumcision is given as a sign of that. 
And that's Paul's argument then, that we can go back and see from the Old Testament, from the very beginning, we have the grace of God is there. It's, it's grace that, that, that enters in when humans are hopelessly estranged from God, fallen away, and is universal, which means that uh, through Abraham and through the grace of God, uh, everyone is included. No one's excluded from the standpoint of God's intention. But grace is itself uh, places a, a demand. As Bonhoeffer said, grace is not cheap. Grace is not just uh, believing a doctrine and following the rules. Grace is abiding and living in that relationship with God. It's like a... I we tell, usually think of a relationship as being, with God, as being rules. Don't yeah, we? sure. But that's, again, that's, that's uh, human beings from Adam and Eve on thought that by somehow keeping rules, they could get back into that relationship. And they, they misunderstood even that the sacrificial system put in place was not a rule to be kept, but it was a way in which they could um, re-enter through grace. It's, it's, it's the grace of God that, that overcomes that death, so that the overcoming of death in the Old Testament moves forward to the God assuming that death. And therefore, as Bart made clear, and I learned from him in Torrance as well, that uh, through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, there is a retroactive kind of uh, theology then to go back and to see that, uh, that it isn't just that the Jews were wrong and we can um, dispense with that. They are, they are the ones that reveal to us God's universal promise and purpose. But the Jews of Jesus' day had torn the law out of the living community of faith and made the law of something, a standard of correctness, and became specialists in the law. But Jesus said, you know, uh, I have come to fulfill the law in grace. So to me, that's why it's so difficult to preach today, because everybody enters in with their own uh, sense. If I just keep the rules, perfectionism and legalism didn't start with theology. Legalism and perfectionism is a psychological thing. People think that if they somehow just do it right, that they'll be accepted. Jesus said, um, uh, you search the scriptures daily that you yeah. Uh, may find eternal life in them, mm -hmm. yet you refuse to come to me. You refuse to come to me, yeah, because they were using, as I say again, that uh, the Pharisees used Scripture to crucify Jesus, to condemn him. If he violates the Sabbath, he's not of God. So there's a difference then between, um, well, it, in uh, uh, Elmer Collier's book, How to Read T.F. Torrance, he comments on the, uh, uh, here, uh, page uh, 86, under the subhead, The Latin Heresy, A Gospel of External Relations. Mm -hmm. And he says, Torrance sees a growing tendency in Latin theology from the fifth century on to reject the idea that Christ assumed our sinful, alienated, and fallen humanity, and to embrace the notion that Christ assumed a neutral, mm -hmm or an original and perfect human nature from the Virgin Mary. And he goes on to show how Torrance taught that whatever Christ did not assume yeah. is not healed. Yeah. Torrance is, trying, is quoting there the Cappadocian theologian Gregory of Nancyansis in the fourth century who said what is not assumed is not healed. And that was in opposition to um, uh, Apollinaris, basically, who argued that uh, um, the Logos uh, of Jesus the, was, was a perfect Logos, in a sense, not totally human. That Jesus was, in a sense, uh, only human from the neck down. <laughs> that the, 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 the self uh, was not involved. And, and uh, Nancyansis said, well, the, the problem is in the self that we are under sentence of death and that, uh, that that has to be overcome so that 
the Latin heresy comes out of the Western tradition at Rome at that sense, from Augustine and following, that began to uh, tear apart the, uh, the atonement from the actual person of Jesus and made out of it a formula, a system, and then began to take grace uh, as a, uh, almost a commodity so that grace became something that you could uh, uh, control by dispensing it, so that the sacraments became then the means by which you could dispense grace and therefore control it. So the heresy that Torrance points to is the heresy of breaking truth apart from God, so to speak. Is it kind of the difference between um a written contract between two people and a, a devoted friendship between two people. In other words, if there's a contract, you work out a law, penalties, etc. if something goes wrong in the relationship. But in a devoted friendship, you've got, you can hurt the relationship, but you've got the freedom to forgive and move on together. Well, uh, more than that, you see, if in fact uh, a relationship, such as a marriage relationship, is contractual, then we hold each other accountable to keeping the contract, so to speak. And uh, therefore, as long as I'm keeping my end of the contract up, you are obligated to, to fulfill my needs. See? Well, that's hopeless, you see. That, so that, that's a form of legalism in marriage. When I pre do premarital counseling, I talk about friendship. I said that friendship is the only human relationship that only survives because it's constantly renewed and uh, kept alive. I said that uh, husbands and wives often will end up saying things to each other in times of uh, anger, or whatever. If they said it to a friend, they wouldn't have any friends. Friends don't have to take it. So people will be on guard and preserve a friendship and at the same time destroy their marriage. So that I say the quality of friendship so that God is, is, is more uh, at the level of uh, the friend. God is the lover. Uh, God enters in with Israel uh, and, and as, as Hosea said, you know, it's, it's, he's the lover. And he's betrayed, but God uh, still said, I won't give you up. I won't let you go. So that uh, it's true that uh, the, the legalistic contractual aspect enters in seemingly to give us security and uh, truth in the sense that we can control. But the fact is, uh, the moment that we think that we control the truth, if I think I control the truth about my wife, um, I've destroyed something. She's always a mystery to me. She's always someone that I have to be open to. And my concepts of her have to give way to who she really is. And it's the same with God, our concepts of God. C.S. Lewis had an amazing statement that in his mercy, he must destroy all our finest concepts of him. <laughs> that, that our theology is already uh, a set of concepts that have to be redeemed. Torrance says the atonement is as much the redeeming of our theology and concepts of God as it is of our sin. <laughs> I see that we're going to have to have more than one interview because there are a number of things that we've got to talk about. Well, yet. it's because you get me started talking <laughs> theology, Mike. And, uh, I need to get into um, to your book, Judas and Jesus, Amazing Grace for the Wounded Soul, but we'll save that for the, okay. for the next program. Um, I'll be back. <laughs> and I just want to um, come back to the kind of theology that Thomas Torrance mm. uh, is uh, explicating and a number of other theologians uh, kind of from Karl Barth's mm. um, theology uh, that I think we call it Trinitarian theology, yeah. and that yeah. um, is a corrective to this, what Torrance called the Latin heresy. Uh, 
Could you talk about that? Yes, for... because as Torrance uh, often made clear in class when I sat under his teaching in Edinburgh, Matthew eleven twenty seven, he said, is the key verse. Now, most of us memorized Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. But he said Matthew 27 is the key verse, which says, Only the Father knows the Son, and only the Son knows the Father, and those to whom it is given. That's a Trinitarian statement. Knowledge of God is self-knowledge. It's, it's the knowledge of God that begins of the Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father. Well, how are you going to gain entry into that? You say, well, if, if only the Father knows the Son, then if I go to the Father, I'll know the Son. Well, you can't do that because only the Son knows the Father. So, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go to the Son to know the Father. Then you can't do that because only the Father knows the Son. Okay, then I have to be brought into that so the Holy Spirit brings me into that inner relationship between the Son and the Father. And, and Torrance said, that's where atonement takes place. Atonement didn't just take place on the cross. Atonement takes place within the inner being of God, through God's love and mercy. Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus, uh, the Son, is, is comes into the world in order to assume human death, die that death, and in resurrection, overcome that death, so that death no longer has the power to determine human destiny. No person's death determines their destiny. And that's the Judas thesis, see, that it's Jesus that determines the destiny of Judas, not even his own action. But we'll talk about that someday. <laughs> but that's Torrance's theology of the Trinity. It takes place the atonement takes place and our relationship is bound up in that. If you don't have the Trinity, then God becomes an abstract set of rules or concepts and we're on our own. Our own humanity then has to, in a sense, bear the weight of worship and prayer. As it is, uh, Jesus in his own humanity continues even now to be the one who prays with us and for us. All worship is the worship of the Son to the Father. That's James Torrance, the brother of Tom, wrote a book on that. True worship is the worship of the Son to the Father, and we're brought into that worship. Our own humanity cannot bear uh, the weight of authentic prayer and worship. The humanity of Christ does that. So practically speaking then, when we pray, we're not really, or we ought not to be really thinking, I hope God hears my mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. We are able to say, with the Holy Spirit that this prayer I pray is the prayer of Christ praying in me. That's right. Therefore, That's right. I have confidence yeah. that right. I actually stand yeah. That's what it means to Christ. pray in His name. It doesn't mean as a little magical formula to put on the end. It's not the bank code that gets you into the ready teller. Uh, praying in His name is to say that the Holy Spirit brings us in so that uh, Jesus takes our prayer and offers it up to the Father. So a recognition that we actually stand together with Christ and He is with us, standing yeah, with yeah. us in all that we do, in yeah. our relationship yeah. with God, gives us a freedom that is not a legalistic. Yeah. You see, the legalistic means we've got to do it right, but uh, we can't ever do that, see. We're in default from the beginning so that if, in fact, Jesus has assumed our condition and has, in a sense, made it right, that's what justification and righteousness mean, he's made it right. But he's made it right not as an um, abstract uh, deposit in our account that we can draw on. He's made it right by saying, uh, come unto me and join with me, and we're going to enter into the kingdom together. So there's a... There's a Faith, our faith then, is in Christ Himself, yes. not in how well we pray or how... No, that's right. The faith is not in something, uh, not in doctrine, it's not in a concept. Uh, faith is itself a, a relational aspect. It is the trust and, and, and it's the Holy Spirit that brings us in to that relationship. So we're saved not by works, but by faith. And, and it, faith is, uh, is for Paul, a, a synonym for Jesus. In, in, in Galatians 3, it's interesting that Paul says, before faith came, we're under the law. You've been watching, you're included.
a production of Grace Communion International.